Hello, Atlanta. <laughs> Hello, Emory. It's my great pleasure to be here. As he said, I'm from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, up I-85. Uh, I drove down I-85 yesterday with my wife, and of course, uh, we wanted to listen to music we liked. Had the Sirius XM going. I'm a big opera fan. Shout out to Tomer. Um, so we had the Metropolitan Opera Channel going. I'm also listening to the first wave. Uh, can't get enough Depeche Mode and Echo and the Bunnymen. And so, uh, quick show of hands, uh, who has listened to music in the last 24 hours? That's nearly everyone. I'm guessing you listened to that because you liked it. Well, we're going to leave that on the back burner for now. We'll get back to music. We're now going to jump into Starlings and the Brain. I'll tell you a little bit of how I got to where I am thinking about the brain. Again, I've, I've been studying the brain for a little over 20 years as an imager using functional MRI techniques. Put someone in the scanner, do a task, see what area of the brain lights up. My colleague Paul Larienti and I were pretty good at this. Uh, we published lots of paper. We were feeling pretty good about ourselves. Uh, climbing the academic ladder, but about 10 years in, we got a little unsettled, a little edgy. Were we really making progress? Just because, uh, I mean, the thought at the time was, if we just find out all the areas of the brain that are active during different tasks, we'll understand the brain. We weren't really making much progress, we thought. We published fancy papers like this, blobs in the brain, the colors means it's active when you're doing a task, or blue, deactive. Um, again, we felt good about ourselves. But it all felt very linear. Like, you did this, it activated this area of the brain. It didn't really feel like we were making much uh, headway into the big questions, consciousness, memory, perceptions, and all sorts of things like that. And so we had been taught to think like this, very linear. Certain cause leads to an effect, a certain outcome. Put someone in the scanner, scan them, this area of the brain lights up, fantastic. Well, that works great in Newtonian systems. It doesn't work so well when you get to complex systems like biology like the brain. They look more like this. We have all these interacting causes and perceptions. They all, they all come in together and you get a certain output. That, of course, that, that output or effect can change even with the same causes. Some of you, the first 150 or so of you who came here today, uh, have in your packet a little handout. It's a piece of paper. It's your little souvenir to take home. It is a picture of this, a very famous uh, illusion by Edward Adelson. Now, if you can see, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a and B. And of course, the question is, are they the same color or not, same shade of gray? Of course, they're not. A is dark and, and B is bright. Well, that's not true. They're the exact same shade of gray. Now, our brain can't let us think that. And this is a classic example of different interacting parts in our brain leading to two different perceptions, two completely different perceptions, even though it's the same color. There's a fake shadow going on. We think all the white squares are white and all the dark ones are the same color. They're not. He's messing with you. But uh, to prove this to you, I'll take the Photoshop here and uh, take away the surrounding squares. If you don't believe me, you think I've done something, find someone who has the handout and you can play with it. They're the exact same color. So again, this is an example of how different interacting bits, our experience with checkerboards and shadows, leads to two different perceptions. So how do we study complex systems? How do, how do we study biologic systems? Well, my favorite way to talk about this, uh, to explain it, is to show you one. So I will show you a complex system. Uh, this is two women in a canoe on a river in Ireland come across a flock of starlings, and they film it. It was an internet uh, sensation several years ago. It is one of the most beautiful ballets you'll see in nature. No choreographer, just a beautiful ballet. So this is a very short clip. Now, we watch that, and it's, it's stunning. Anytime, anytime you see a flock of starlings do this, it's called a murmuration. Um, remember that word. Um, 
but it's beautiful, and we know we've witnessed something. So how, how would you study this flock? How would you study these patterns? Would you catch a bird and look at it? No, you wouldn't. You cannot simply focus on a single bird. You have to focus on the relationships of that bird with all of its neighbors. Turns out starlings follow three pretty simple rules. Follow your neighbor pretty close, but not too close. And so uh, you're, you're interacting with your neighbors who are also interacting with their neighbors. And so each bird is affecting the flight of all the other birds. This is a complex system. This is a network. I believe the brain works this way. You have, instead of birds, you have little neurons that are talking to each other, and and they are obeying very simple rules, but you get these incredible patterns that lead to us being human. Now, networks, we've heard about them already. We heard in the first talk about National Geographic. Um, It's very common for people today to think about networks. We are swimming through all sorts of social networks right now. This is the one for old people. This is the Facebook. People my age and older. Uh, this is Facebook all over the world. There are other ones for younger people. Uh, the, you know, the Twitter and the Instagram and all that good stuff. But we're, it's just very common. We know what social networks are. Um, but the key in understanding networks is the relationships between the parts of the network. The parts, perhaps, are less important than the actual relationships. This is a major leap in neuroscience to start caring more about these relationships than the parts themselves. If you remember, I was talking about functional MRI. We were looking at areas that activated. We cared about each little area. This did this, this did that. Now we're looking more of how are things playing together and interacting. So, so how do we do this? How do we do brain networks? How do we build them? We still do functional MRI. MRI. We put them in the scanner and we do certain tasks. But now, instead of looking for this area is active or that area is active, we now look for synchronicity. What area is synced to another area? That is the key in network science. And let me show you one. This is a brain network. It doesn't look like a brain to you. It looks more like a flock of starlings, I would argue. This is a murmuration in the brain. Uh, Each dot is a small little piece of tissue in the brain. And each little line or edge is an area that is synchronous with that other piece of tissue. There's tens of thousands of connections in this, in this picture right here. The colors themselves represent small subnetworks within the larger network. And there's a network in here, the yellow one at the top, called the default mode network. That and murmuration uh, will be on the test at the end of the day. So uh, default mode network, DMN. It's all the rage in network, uh, brain network stuff. So I'm going to concentrate on that network for the next part of my talk, which is the music part of the talk. Now, this doesn't look like a brain, so it's kind of hard to visualize, but we can take that yellow network and map it into brain space and ignore all the other networks. That's what it looks like. This looks like a brain to you, hopefully, and uh, the, the blobs this time represent areas that are in sync. These aren't the active areas. These are the in sync areas of the default mode network. It's got three different components. Areas uh, here, that's the front of the brain, the frontal lobes. Areas in the back of the brain, these parietal lobes at the back. And deep areas, this is the posterior cingulate precuneus. Just remember, there's an area in the front, area in the back, and deep areas of the brain. You want your default mode network to be in sync. Um, uh, Many uh, people believe that it's involved in self-referential thoughts, thoughts about yourself. Also, it gives you the ability, if it's in sync, to understand what other people are thinking. Empathy, for example, we heard about that. I like to say it lets us know our place in the world, and you really do want an intact default mode network. It tends to fall apart as you age. It totally falls apart in Alzheimer's disease. Um, Also, it becomes um, less intact in schizophrenia, depression, and other neurologic disorders. So that brings us to music in the brain. We've, we just heard a talk on opera. Uh, um, music is a powerful force. Thank you for chuckling, those who did it. This, uh, <laughs> this, this means nothing to people younger than uh, uh, 35, but this, it means something to us old people. But music is a powerful force, force. We just heard about that from Atlanta Opera. That's the point of opera, I would argue. You can go see a play, and uh, it's, it can be very powerful. But you put music to those words, and the highs get higher, the lows get lower. It is a more emotionally intense experience. 
support your Atlanta opera. <laughs> I think Victor Hugo probably says it better than I do. Music, uh, I can't see that far. Music expresses that which cannot be said and on which it is impossible to be silent. Well said, Victor. So, I'm going to show some images here. These are different uh, singers and performers. And if you have any connection with these people, you'll feel something. Guarantee it. I'm throwing up some people that I kind of like. And, but you would have maybe different ones. But this is Lady Gaga. There's B.B. King playing Lucille. Yo-Yo Ma. Ella Fitzgerald. Luciano Pavarotti. Edith Piaf. David Bowie, John Lennon. Again, just seeing those images, I bet you and some of you, you felt something, a little frisson. Uh, you, again, you might have different images that, that do this for you. I, I think almost all of you raised your hand if you'd listen to music in the last 24 hours. What did you listen to? Uh, Saved by Khalid. Khalid. <laughs> Sorry I didn't have a photo of Khalid. Uh, <laughs> For my, for my talk, I, this was not planted, I'm sorry. But, uh, but I'm guessing you listened to that because you liked it. And as I was doing as I traveled down I-85. I like to say that uh, music makes a situation or a, or a ceremony matter. If, if it matters, it's going to have music. There was some music here in the little break. This must matter. Uh, a graduation, does it have music? Of course it does. Any sort of uh, religious service. A wedding, it has music. The Super Bowl, wouldn't matter without music. All I remember about the Super Bowl two years ago was that Lady Gaga sang, and I've deleted everything else as I believe that this city has as well. <laughs> I like to say music actually makes it matter. So what did we do? Again, uh, you, you said you, miss, you liked Khalid. Um, we did a study where we, we were interested in people's preference. If they like music, what does your brain look like versus if you don't like it? So we had people listen to five different genres. Rock and roll, kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. And party every day. Uh, <laughs> country music, Brad Paisley's Water. Classical music was the first five minutes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. The uh, rap, hip hop, they listened to Usher's OMG. And they, uh, unfamiliar, with, they listened to Chinese opera, which is unfamiliar to Western ears. We wanted something in there that was a little bit different. In addition, we asked each person, if you could listen to one thing in the scanner, what would it be? And you got a week to think about it. And so they would get back to us. And people were very specific about this. One said, Let It Be by the Beatles. It has to be that. Another one, La Vie en Rose, Edith Piaf. One, uh, the, the last five minutes of Mahler's Second Symphony, Birmingham Symphony, Simon Rattle conducting, period, end. And so, I mean, pe people are very specific on this. And so they listen to those five things plus their favorite. So what did we see? And I'm just going to show you the default mode network results. You're familiar with that. Remember, it's on the test. Um, if you liked it, and they rated it, these in the scanners, if you liked it, this is what the default mode network looked like. It's relatively intact. It has frontal areas. Here's the front here these posterior parietal areas, and the deep areas. It's a relatively intact default mode network. What about if you didn't like it? Now, none of you people, very few of you anyway, are neuroscientists, I'm guessing, or do brain imaging, but anyone can see that that is different. The dislike, it does not look like the like. There is a big red blob in the posterior cingulate, and it's not talking at all to the frontal areas or the other posterior areas. It is massively connected, that's what the bright red means, but it's only connected to itself functionally. That's a, now, I don't need to tell you that you feel different when you're listening to something you dislike, but we see some of the underpinnings of that now. That now. Uh, what about if it was your favorite? Clearly, the default mode network is the most intact when you're listening to your favorite piece, frontal areas, posterior areas, deep areas. And I would argue as I said, it, 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 it lets you know your place in the world, perhaps. When you're listening to your favorite music, perhaps that's why we do it. It, it. it makes us feel the best. It makes us understand our place in the world. Now, we look at other areas of the brain, when we, when we, uh, other networks, not just the default mode network. And some of them are very relevant to um, rehabilitation, neuro-rehabilitation. 
for people who have suffered neurologic injury. But that will be a topic for a, another TED Talk if I'm invited back. <laughs> so, I'm now going to send you off and hope that you think about the amazing ballet of neurons interacting with each other. A murmuration, if you will, in your brain, especially as you listen to music. Thank you. <laughs>